Enter Jack and Draca and his novel paper sensor that he says he can produce for about three cents. Jack. Have you ever experienced a moment in your life that was so painful and confusing that all you wanted to do was learn as much as you could to make sense of it all? When I was 13, I lost a close family friend who was like an uncle to me to pancreatic cancer. When the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more, so I went online to find answers. Using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer, and what I had found shocked me. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. Why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason today's current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique. I mean, that's older than my dad. <laughs> but also, it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. Learning this, I was sure there had to be a better way. So I went back online, and I found what a sensor would really have to look like to effectively diagnose pancreatic cancer. The sensor would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And we'll wait for that to catch up. Okay. And so there's a reason why this test hasn't been updated in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for pancreatic cancer, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these different levels of proteins in there. And this sounds very straightforward, but it's anything but. Because you have these liters and liters of blood that's already abundant in protein. And you're looking for this tiny increase in this tiny amount of protein. That's next to impossible. I mean, that's like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred due to my teenage optimism, I went, <laughs> I went back online and to any teenager's best friends for knowledge, Google Wikipedia, how I pass every high school test. <laughs> and I found an article of over 8,000 different proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these different types of cancers. And so then I just decided I'm just going to chug through this. And I felt a little bit like I was playing this video game called Pokemon, like Pokemon catch them all, like proteins got to research them all. And on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sanity, I found one protein. I kind of felt like I was like, watching like, all the TV series in just like an hour. It was pretty bad. I like, just didn't go out of the house at all. I just stayed in the basement. <laughs> and so the name of the protein I found was called mesotheon. And it's just an ordinary, run-of-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream but also it's found in the earliest stage, when something has close to 100% chance of survival. So now that I found a reliable protein to detect, I then shifted my focus to actually detecting that protein, and thus the presence of pancreatic cancer. And my epiphany moment came in the most unlikely of places, high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. <laughs> Particularly with my high school teacher. So essentially, I'd snuck in this article on what are called single-walled carbon nanotubes, long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and 1 50,000th the diameter of your hair. And they're extremely, extremely small, but they have these amazing properties, kind of like the superheroes of material science. And then while I was sneakily reading this article on their properties under my desk, we are supposed to be learning about these things called antibodies. And an antibody, you can imagine like a lock and key. It only reacts with one specific protein, in this case, the cancer biomarker. And so then I was just sitting in biology class when suddenly it hit me. What I could do is I could combine these two concepts. Essentially, you take these antibodies and weave them into the network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. But also, it will change its electrical properties based on the amount of protein present due to the properties of these carbon nanotubes, and thus indicate the presence of pancreatic cancer. However, there's a catch. <laughs> Just th there always is a catch. It's too good to be true. But essentially what happens is you have these networks of nanotubes, and they're extremely flimsy. And since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So that's why I chose to use paper. 
And making a paper sensor for cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I love. <laughs> Essentially, you start with some water, you pour in some nanotubes, pour in some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and then you can detect cancer. <laughs> However, all of a sudden, when I had this great epiphany, my biology teacher, I swear she has like eyes on the back of her head or something, she turns around really slowly and it's just like, Mr. Andrejko, where are you reading there? Give me this really like mean leer almost. <laughs> and she storms over and snatches it out of my hands and is like threatening to put it through the paper shredder. I did not like that biology teacher. However, I eventually like begged her to give it back to me after like a half hour of this giant lecture. I finally get it back and that's all I really wanted from her. And then I could finally start researching this idea. And so after I'd finally gotten all of my like, ideas together, I then realized something. Hey, I might need a lab. I mean, I can't do cancer research on my kitchen countertop. <laughs> and so essentially, like, my mom has put up with a lot of stuff. Like, I cultured E. coli where we make sandwiches and make explosives in the basement. She wasn't too happy about that. And then cancer research, I'm not sure if she's going to really support that. And it's also it's a bit of expense. So. Essentially, what happened is I had the brilliant idea to send 200 different professors my research plan, this 32-page long document that I thought no one in their right mind would read. And so then I contacted 200 professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institute of Health, begging them to let me into their lab. And I kind of like cyber stalked them, like I'd go onto their page and be like, what are your research interests? Ooh, pancreatic cancer. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> And then I would email them, and I emailed them this giant document, and then I sat back waiting for these positive emails to pour in, and like, I would be like, hell, this is genius kid, I'm gonna be able to pick and choose my lab. And then reality took hold. Got 199 rejections. I mean, it was pretty hard. I mean, it's hard enough for like a high schooler to like not get chosen for the dodgeball team, but like <laughs> 200 rejections. But, um, and also I realized those professors, they, don't, they aren't nearly as nice as they look like in their profile pictures. <laughs> However, eventually I got one positive email back from Dr. Aaron von Maitre at Johns Hopkins University. So I go in with these giant stacks of blue ring binders full of these different articles I had found, 500 of them. And I go in, I slam them down on his desk and he kind of peers over them. And he's just like, so tell me about your project. And as soon as I launch into my description, he spots a few PhD students and he's like, get in here, get in here. And then he like goes around and collects all of the PhD students, gathers them in the room, and there are 20 of them. And then me and the professor all crammed into this like tiny room. I was just like, how many PhDs can we fit into a room? <laughs> I think we might have set the Guinness World Record there. However, the interrogation begins, and they're just firing these questions at me, trying to sync my procedure. <laughs> However, I got through it, I answered all the questions, I guessed on quite a few, and I always guessed C, so I got them all right. I guess C, <laughs> just like I do on my SATs. <laughs> and I landed the lab space I needed to do my research. And just as soon as I started, I realized my once brilliant procedure had something like a million holes in it. And that might have been the reason why some of those professors rejected me, but in my opinion, I think they're just buttheads. <laughs> And then I just start going through this, I am patching up all these holes in my procedure, and eventually seven months later, I end up with one small paper sensor. That costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. It's 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current standards for pancreatic cancer detection. But also, oh. <laughs> But also, it is 100% accuracy so far in trials and can detect the cancer in the earliest stage when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal survival rates of pancreatic cancer from 5.5% to close to 100%. And it would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. By switching out that antibody, you could potentially detect any protein in the world, meaning any disease in the world, ranging from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. And so through this, we've, I've learned this very important lesson. That there are two things that are blocking innovation. The first of which is that 75% of the entire world lacks a basic tool to innovate. 
they lack access to the internet. Because through the internet, anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your ideas valued. You could be a 15-year-old like me. And then also, regardless of your age, your gender, your ethnicity, any of that, regardless of anything like that, it's just your ideas that count. However, these people just don't have access. Even though the internet allows us to improve our conditions and express ourselves, it allows us to emerge from this delicate fragmentation of nations and instead emerge as one united human race. But these people don't have access and thus lack the basic tools to innovate because they don't have the knowledge to innovate at the moment. They're creative, but if you don't have the knowledge, then how can you innovate? And so that's the first thing that's blocking innovation. And once we get that to all the people, then there's a second roadblock. And I experienced this one. It's the fact that most scientific journals are locked tightly behind paywalls. For example, essentially what happens is the first time I ran to one of these, I was in sixth grade during my first science fair. I was this little nerdy sixth grader with like a bowl cut and these big glasses, like a kind of stereotype of a nerd. And I go on and I'm trying to get this article and it says, pay $35 if you want this article. And I'm like, oh wait, there's a login. And so then I try and log in with the only known login to me at the moment, my email password. So I log in, and it immediately comes back invalid, and I think, well, you're invalid, Mr. Computer. <laughs> However, I, I kind of persisted before completely like, freaking out and just banging random keys, my go-to solution for any computer issue. <laughs> I essentially go in, and I beg my parents, give me $35, come on, come on. And I just bought them straight for a week, just as any normal little kid would do. I bring them this giant list of reasons, I'm reading it off, and they're fine, Jack, just take this $35, just stop annoying us. So I the day I like, bought that article, I felt like Charlie Bucket buying the golden ticket. And then I realized it had nothing to do with my research. <laughs> and the unfortunate thing about these paywalls is they don't have a return policy. I can't just be like, can I please have my money back? Oh no, if you bought that article, we're keeping your money. And so then I realized, hey, why, why is anyone paying $35 for like 11 sheets of paper? And I realized it. Scientific journals have commoditized scientific knowledge. They have locked up the most valuable human resource on the planet, scientific knowledge. You see, they've made an $8 billion market. Harvard University can't afford these subscriptions. It states in a statement to its, all of its people, major periodical subscriptions, especially to electronic journals, published by historically key providers, cannot be sustained. Continuing on these subscriptions on their current footing is financially untenable. Now, what does it say about the flow of information, access to academic knowledge, and the ability to innovate when Harvard University, the richest academic university in the world, cannot afford its articles? It has $3 million. 15-year-olds don't have that type of money. <laughs> what we need is to unlock these paywalls, to realize that this is not acceptable. The public funds this research. The journal takes in that research and then turns it around and sells it back to us at inflated prices. And this issue is exasperated for smaller state schools. My brother, he's going to this awesome state university called Virginia Tax soon, and he's so excited he's majoring in chemical engineering. However, due to the wealth discrepancy between Virginia State and these high-ranked schools like Harvard, the problem is he won't get the same access to articles as students there, like my friend Kathy going to Stanford, he won't get the same access to articles. This tier-based approach to the dissemination of scientific knowledge, in my opinion, is extremely detrimental to the entire field, and we need to fix it. And <laughs> and not just one singular person can fix this. We as a whole human race have to fix this. This is our problem, not just one of our problem. And so hopefully, we can all strive to solve this, because really, all you need is an idea and a bit of passion. I mean, I didn't even know what a pancreas was when I started on this. <laughs> so if a 15-year-old could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what you could do. Thank you.
Jack was with us on Wednesday, but yesterday he zipped down to Washington. Jack, tell us what you did in Washington. I was accepting an award from President Barack Obama for Champions of Change in Open Science. Yeah.